The Fortress, a short story. Chapters 4 and 5. Five. At five, Dizzy was growing into a little builder of shacks and huts, managing boards twice his length and far heavier than a boy his age could lift. Bright ideas were faster than the growth spurts of boys. Dizzy got halfway into a build, and a new idea popped into his head, he leaving one construction site for another. To this, one expected that the scholars and experts raising lost civilizations and ruins out of the jungles and deserts of the world might discover these weren't ruins at all, but the abandoned, half-formed creations of larger-than-life children overly enthusiastic to build. Dizzy was five when he discovered the manzanita sprawling along the drive. There were hard points to the branches, like teeth or thorns. The color was so sinister that he thought the manzanita would bleed if he cut at it. Upon discovering the manzanita, it pricked him in several places on his arms and hands. Pain sometimes left one with respect. Dizzy left the red bushes alone for the moment. There was a massive manzanita bush up on the hill above the house. Dizzy, being father's little hero, tried cutting it back, because father never liked those bushes. The wood was tough and rubbery, the skin peeling back like banana peels. The wood under the skin was slippery and difficult for the dull saw to bite into. It was the only saw Dizzy could find, teeth so large that the smaller twigs and branches fell between them. Dizzy nearly cut his finger as the saw bounced out where he started to cut. The saw was too big for the boy. This was obvious in how he struggled to pull it through the wood. The effort was too much for the branches he could reach as he fought against the sharp little points and thorns. The bush fought back. Daddy hated these little red bushes and wanted nothing to do with them. And then Daddy came home. Boy, where is my little saw? Daddy hadn't been home more than an hour when he needed the saw, a simple little chore that distracted him from being home. Dizzy frowned, looking down at his hands. It was lunchtime, and he smelled the hamburger sitting on his plate. Little saw? This was confusing, because what was little for the man was giant for the boy. Where is it? I don't remember. So you did have it? Yes. I was cutting the red bush you hate so much. That's that's what I was doing. You were doing what? That bush. I was going to cut it for you. Where is the saw? Is it still up there? I don't remember. Father was more angry when he found the same saw left rusting in the grass from the last time Dizzy used it. He never asked about the bandage on Dizzy's hand as he stood over Dizzy or the bruises on his arm. It's still up there, isn't it? Yes. It slipped out of my hand and fell where I couldn't reach. Mother sat by, eating her hamburger as she read a western. She left them alone to talk it through. Father was rarely father enough, so he had to catch up on fatherhood in the short time he was home. She wouldn't interfere, even as Dizzy looked at her, then down at his hamburger. The saw is too big for you. You know that. I know. Dizzy looked at the edge of the table, where he hardly reached his plate of food. You'll have to figure it out, how to get it back. Yes. I will need it before I leave for work. Yes. Thorns It was early in the morning. Summer bugs buzzed through a band of sunlight breaking between trees. Dizzy watched a pair of chipmunks dart across the drive. The bugs circled Dizzy's head and vanished. He watched after them and shrugged. They not worth capturing to add to his collection. He walked to the ray of light where it left a spot at the edge of the drive. From there he caught a looming shadow at the edge of the big pine, somewhere a monster could hide, in a place dark as night in the morning. There was no monster. No glowing eyes or fangs, yet the tension held him. Then Dizzy heard cars and trucks pass down the highway and forgot the shadow. He didn't see the machines, but guessed what they were from their sound. A pickup, an old car, a motorcycle, a logging truck, empty one way and loaded the other, just from the sound of its engine. The trucks were a fascination for the boy, massive as wild beasts in books of prehistory, iron and grease and rust, 
old diesel engines and tires as hard and heavy as the earth itself. They were modern-day dinosaurs. Dizzy drew versions of these behemoths he heard rolling down the road, with a scatter of colored ballpoint pens to lavish every detail he could into the things he drew. He never finished the drawings, disappointed they weren't as noisy or immediate as the real things he never saw. Sometimes Dizzy followed the sounds rolling along the highway, a race from where he first heard them coming to where he could see them at the far end of the property. It was a race he never won. From the back door was the clothesline and the big oak in the middle of the backyard. Beyond the far edge of the backyard was the sweep of terraces spanning the lower hillside between the house and the gardens, and further on the highway. The gardens were terraced as well, like the wide steps down from the gates of a castle. Carrots, cabbage, zucchini, squash, strawberries, green beans, beets, and potatoes. There was a ten-foot earthen wall at the edge of the highway, a rusty fence, and some tall weeds. The furthest tree line between the terraces and the highway were the cherry trees. Before Dizzy got to the big oak in the backyard, the terraces and the garden, he had to run by the blackberry bushes. Beyond the blackberry bushes was a vast frontier for the boy to cross in a short amount of time. Dizzy ran by the blackberry bushes as fast as he could. The twisted vines and thorns of the blackberry bushes were hope incarnate, and disappointment everlasting. The hope was in the summer, of gorging oneself on the sweet berries plucked from the vines. The disappointment was that the berries worth eating were plucked by the endless swarms of birds nesting in the bushes, robins, crows, blue jays, and starlings, leaving only the berries that were the riskiest to get, behind a wall of thorns. Little was different with the cherry trees at the bottom of the hill, a frustration when in season, a battle between the birds who ravished the ripening fruit and mother who had little free time to pick the berries. Different than the cherry trees, the blackberry vines were rife like weeds, growing against the edge of raised earth the house was built on. The wall of thorns stood up straight and tall like a black knight in a fantasy, bold and daring and dangerous and demanding the best bravery from all who dared cross. The vines had to be burned or cut back on a regular basis, a temporary measure, the earth as a barrier, a jetty against the tide of thorns. The north side of the house faced the clay terraces father dug into the earth. Over the top of the terraces were small apple trees sunning themselves. The apples were easier to get, but not as sweet. Dizzy listened for a moment and heard a modern diesel trundle by, the soft whistle of a turbo at the top of a gear change. It was another garbage truck on its way to drop off a load. The county dump was on an adjacent road across the highway. Without the traffic from the highway, there was only the sound of midsummer bugs. Dizzy raced and raced and reached the cherry trees. That was as far as he could go. Another vehicle passed down the highway. Dizzy could only hear it, but not see it from where he hung on the fence. In another year or two, he would be tall enough to see down into the highway. He looked back at where he had come, the house so far up the hillside the wall of blackberry vine still higher, rising over the wall of earth, with all the fury of thorns and robins. A few minutes passed like hours. He went to play, the summer day nearly half spent, on an isolated hope of someone coming up the drive. 